Hey, 242, how are we? Good. Hey, we are all seven campuses uh, together. And what I love about that is there's a reminder to us that we are a church that is for Michigan. Uh, we get to be a church that is for the community in, in Taylor and Monroe and Livonia and Ann Arbor and Saginaw and Lansing and Brighton. And it's such an awesome thing to be a church that gets to impact so many different communities uh, and so many people. So welcome to everybody. I'm um, so glad to be stepping into this series with us. We are in what we call our, our biblical literacy series. So we, this is something we started this summer with the Gospel of Mark. And the intention behind it is to just improve biblical literacy. It's, it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? I mean, even the Bibles in your chairs are themed in the same way that our series are. And it's just a, a bunch of series that we're doing over the course of the existence of 242 to just dig into and maybe demystifies the, mystify the Bible a little bit. If you're, if you're like me growing up, um, there was a part of picking up this book that was a little bit scary. Uh, because books are written in different ways and there's so many different genres and understandings and histories in this Bible that for me when I was younger, it was, it was scary because I didn't fully understand it. Um, but it's really not that hard to understand, which is why we jump into it together in the way that we are. So the book of Daniel is the book that we are beginning to explore today together. But I want to remind you that if you have our app on your phone, which you should already, if you don't, you can grab your phone right now. It's not going to bother me, wherever you are, uh, to go ahead and download that app because we have a Bible reading plan for you. It is one thing for you to come to church, gather together, and listen to us talk about the scriptures. It's a whole other thing for you to open up the word of God for yourself and explore what God has for you. So we've created a Bible reading plan for you that we are doing together that we invite you to come along with us on. So when you go into the Bible app, this will be the, the page. You can see all the resources button right there for the Bible literacy uh, series on the book of Daniel. But if you click on this button right down here in the bottom right-hand corner that's highlighted in red for your convenience, it says Bible, it'll bring up this screen and then if you click on plan, it will take you to the plan and you can read along the book of Daniel with us because again, it is one thing to, for you to listen to us talk about scripture. It's a whole other thing for you to dig into it for yourself. And that's what we encourage you to do. As we, as we jump into the book of Daniel though, I wanna, I wanna kind of paint a picture of how I think many of us approach our faith and, and our walk with Jesus. And, and I'm gonna demonstrate with this circle. Right, so, so let's imagine that the circle is our faith relationship. So once we enter into a relationship with Jesus, maybe we're baptized, maybe you were just recently baptized and you're like, wow, I'm in this awesome relationship with Jesus and I'm in this new world that is my faith. So what we often picture is that in the center here is this entity of God, right? And our job as followers of Jesus is to draw ourselves closer to God. So we do that through worship, we do it through prayer, we do it through all kinds of different forms of fellowship and serving, all kinds of different things that we do. The goal is to get ourselves closer to God. But you've been in situations in your life where you felt distant, that you felt like you were far from God. Maybe, maybe things just went bad in your life that um, someone passed away, you had a relationship that fell apart financially, you're struggling. Maybe you've been praying, you've been seeking out God, you haven't heard anything from him. And because of that, you're like, I'm in this faith journey, but I'm kind of like over here. I feel like I'm a long way from God and I'm just trying to, trying to get back there. Or maybe things have been great for you. And like spiritually, you're thriving, everything is great. Like you're hearing from God, things are clicking. So you're like, man, Tony, I'm right here. I'm like, I'm right I'm really near to God. I feel really close to God. And, and, and the way we approach our faith often is like we're just trying to, you know, wherever we are, we're just trying to draw ourselves in closer to God. The, the more we can do, the more effort we put into it, the closer we get to God. And, and that's fine, but what I wanna propose today is maybe that's not how we should understand our relationship with God. It is that, that maybe it's not about us trying to draw closer to God. Because here's what I want you to understand for today is how close we feel to God is not what determines his nearness. How close we feel to God is not what determines how near God actually is to us. And I think this is what we want to explore today as we jump into the book of Daniel. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, grab those, open them up, Daniel chapter one. Uh, join us as we begin this journey through a really really cool book of the Bible. Would you pray with me as we get started? Lord God, we are so very thankful for your word. We're thankful for the ability for us to open it up, to read it, not just read words that, that happened so long ago, but God, we know that these are living, breathing words of God, and they speak to us, and they do a, 
an amazing work in our life today. So Holy Spirit, would you work through everything that we do this weekend? That we may experience you, may we feel you, and may grow closer to you, experience you in a, in a new and powerful way today through your holy word in this book called Daniel. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the, the book of Daniel is a curious book. Uh, the book is often referred to as one of the simplest books in the Bible, and at the same time referred to as one of the most complex books of the Bible. It, it's really divided into two sections. If you want to look at it, the first six chapters, it uh, really talks about kind of the life of Daniel and his three friends, kind of narrates that story. And it's often seen as a simple book of the Bible because a lot of those stories are stories that kids' ministry uses because they're easy to teach. They're powerful stories. They're easy to teach and wrap your minds around. You kind of understand Daniel the lion's den, all that good stuff. Today's story is one of those stories. So it's, it's one of the most simple books of the Bible in that way. But then you get to chapter 7 through 12, and we begin to see these, these visions that God gave Daniel. And these visions are grand and they're spectacular and they're vivid and they're powerful and they're amazing and they're really sometimes complicated and hard to wrap our minds around. In fact, theologians and biblical scholars have debated and argued for generations about what these visions mean and how do we interpret them and how do we understand them in light of so many other things. So we look at 7 through 12 and we're like, wow, it's one of the most complicated books of the Bible. At the same time, it's also one of the most simple books of the Bible. But I think one of the things we're going to discover as we navigate our way through this book is there, there are some themes, and I think one of the themes we have to understand is that God is sovereign. That we're going to see woven throughout the entire text of Daniel the sovereignty of God, not just the sovereignty of God, but the fact that God will have victory over all human evil and brokenness in this world. We see that woven through the first six chapters and the story that, that narrates Daniel and his friends' lives, and, and we see it in the visions that God gives to Daniel. Find ourselves in, in 605 BC before Jesus came along, and this is where the story begins to pick up. Babylon has just conquered Jerusalem, and, and when they conquered Jerusalem, there's, there's like there is with every victory in the Bible, there's plundering and pillaging of the city. And, and they do all that, but they also take the people and they, they turn them into exiles. They, they rip them from Jerusalem and they take them to distant lands. But, but they, didn't just, they didn't just remove the people. They didn't just take them to a different place. King Nebuchadnezzar, whether you like his plan or not, he had a plan and it was really kind of brilliant. His plan was not just to put them into exile, his plan was to, to rewire them. His intention was to strip them of their culture and replace it with Babylonian culture. He wanted to change the people. He wanted to change their identity and who they were. So he, he gets his guys together and they go out and they try to find the best of the best that came out of Jerusalem. And the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men, listen, listen to the description of what they were looking for. Without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter into the king's service. This was a kind of a cool deal, right? I mean, imagine if you were one of those guys or maybe a parent of one of those guys. This is like a full ride scholarship to King Nebuchadnezzar College. That's what this is. It's a full ride to three years of education, but it's even better than that. It's like you're a football player at an SEC school. Not only do you have a full ride academically, but there's a lot of other stuff under the table that you get too. So they're getting all kinds of food, all kinds of benefits. It's a great deal for them. It's almost a deal that's it's a little too good to be true. You ever run into one of those? It's a deal that's just too good to be true. And if you were the best of the best, it even gets better that you get to enter into the king's service. I remember years ago, we were um, planting a church and one of our neighbors in our new community that we just moved into invited me to lunch. And I thought, this is great, awesome, it's a connection. Maybe this helps us in the church plant. What I discovered when I got there to meet him for lunch was that he had a friend with him and the whole lunch was about pitching me a pyramid scheme. 
And the pyramid scheme was this, this health drink. And this health drink was going to cure people of all kinds of stuff. And the claims that they were making were crazy. And I remember asking the question, man, if it does all that stuff, why aren't you put in Walmart where it's accessible for everybody? And they were convinced that the best way to do it was to recruit you and then you recruit other people and we create this pyramid. That was the best way to help people in their health. Fortunately, my wife and I, who maybe weren't the smartest people in the world because we were really young at the time, like we saw through it and it was like, there's no way I'm gonna be a part of that get rich quick scheme. Our neighbors across the street, however, they made a different decision. So they bought into it, right? And they were excited because they bought in. They were up at the, toward the top of the pyramid and they were super excited about their position because they were going to get rich. Unfortunately, she, every time she drank the drink, got sick. So her, like, her stomach churned, like it was a horrible thing. Like she couldn't touch the stuff. But they wanted to keep their position so they kept buying box after box after box of it. And every time they came home from work, their garage door would open. You could look out our window and see piles of boxes of this drink that they couldn't drink, but they were sure that eventually they were gonna get rich. They never got rich. It never worked. It was too good to be true, right? We, we encounter these all the time. So there's always something too good to be true, but a lot of people buy into them. I mean, pyramid schemes exist because people buy into them. I think this whole thing was appealing to a lot of people. And a lot of people probably jumped into it and thought, oh, this is awesome. This is great, fantastic. I want three years of free education. I want all that food from the king's table. I want the opportunity to enter into the king's service. This is great. If I can't live in Jerusalem, I might as well maximize my opportunity here. And Nebuchadnezzar was counting on the fact that they would step into this and not really notice the fact that he was actually reprogramming them into a different culture. I don't think he was ready for a guy named Daniel, though. You see, Daniel is a Jewish name. And if you're going to strip someone of their culture, you should probably strip them of their, their name that reminds them of their culture. So, so they were renamed. Belteshazzar was his name. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you're probably familiar with those names, were, were given to his friends. The king changed Daniel's name, was, was a part of the indoctrination into the Babylonian culture. But here's, here's the interesting thing. We are not studying the book of Belteshazzar. We are studying the book of Daniel. And all throughout the text, when we read through this book, Daniel is always referred to as Daniel. And it's interesting to me, and I think it's important to know that even though he's in a different place, different location, different culture, he's not a different person. He's still Daniel. And I think it's important because it really is a theme of the book especially of today. It's, it's kind of the crux of the story. That Daniel was intent on remaining Daniel. That he didn't want to be conformed. He didn't want to change. He didn't want to become Babylonian. So let's jump to uh, verse number eight. It says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. When I was uh, in high school, uh, this is my pre-Jesus days. So um, students, kids, the things I'm about to share, you should not do. Uh, my pre-Jesus days, we would go out and we would toilet paper our friends' houses. Um, and we'd do other fun things, like if you stick plastic forks in their yard and it freezes, they can't really get them out. And um, we would spray fart spray in lockers and we would ring doorbells at 2 a.m. Just fun stuff, like stuff that would annoy people but not damage anyone's property or anything like that. One time I took fire, you know those string firecrackers? Like I, I hooked one inside my dad's door so early in the morning when he got up to go to work and he opened the door, it was like a gun went off and he came running into the house and yelled at my brother for it. It was awesome, it was so cool. But like that kind of stuff we would do just to have fun and it didn't hurt anybody, it just really annoyed people, right? There was this one friend's house that we toilet papered all the time and me and a buddy went one time. We, we probably did it three times a year um, and we did it during like not Halloween seasons too which made it more fun. And we went one day and my friend had this idea that he was gonna do something. And for legal purposes, I cannot share what it was he was going to do. And uh, so, but I felt uncomfortable with it. Like I didn't like it because I was fine with like, let's just annoy people and do funny things, but there's a line. And at some point, you just can't cross that line. So my friend's getting ready to do this thing and I'm like really torn, like I don't know what to do. Like this is my friend's house too. and I, I just don't agree with what's happening. Fortunately, I've spent enough time at this friend's house to know exactly where you need to step to set off the motion lights in the yard. So right when my other friend was getting ready to do what he was going to do, I just stepped to the left. 
And what I didn't know was that they had put in much brighter bulbs. <laughs> so the entire yard poof, lights up like the 4th of July and we just take off running, right? We're both freaking out. We're running down the road and we hear a shotgun go off <laughs> as, we're, as we're running. That was the last time we toilet papered that house. And when we got to the car, I remember the conversation with my friends saying, what in the world happened? What took place? And I was like, I have no idea. I don't know. And I never told him to this day that I set off the motion detector light to make him stop. But for me, but for me, it was a line. I just couldn't cross it. It was fine to do some of these things and have some fun along the way. But, but he created lines like, I just, I can't go there. At some point in our lives, we find a line that our behavior just, we just can't cross it. We can't enter into that behavior. We can't live that kind of life. And we have to make a decision to not cross that line. Daniel makes the decision to not cross the line. Now, his line happens to be the food that he's eating. Now, there's been a lot of speculation about, like, why the food. And there's actually a lot of theories about this. But none of them are, like, 100% perfect theories. Like, one of them was that um, there was a concern about the Jewish Um, food laws and what they could and could not eat. But the problem with that is like there was nothing that barred them from drinking wine. So the question is why why bar wine if that was the reason? Uh, Another theory is that some of the meat would have been ceremonially unclean. Well, the, the problem with that one is that a lot of ceremonially uncleanliness had to do with the way that food was prepared. And it's very likely that a lot of the vegetables were ceremonially unclean because of the way they were handled and prepared as well in Babylon. And there's another theory that the food that, that passed through the king's table, the meat was, was sacrificed to idols, and you don't want to eat meat that was sacrificed to false gods, but the truth of the matter is most of the food that crossed the king's table had gone through the temple and had been sacrificed to false gods, so that doesn't really stand up either. So there's some debate about why. I don't really think it was about the food, though. I don't think Daniel made this decision specifically about the food. It may have influenced it, but I think at the end of the day, Daniel didn't have a control over a whole lot. Daniel had control over this. Daniel could decide what he did and did not put into his mouth. So he draws a line there. And the one thing he can control, why? Because he did not want to simply conform to Babylonian culture. He didn't want to fully assimilate into what they were doing. Now here's, here's the thing that I love about scripture. And this is maybe, oddly enough, one of my favorite verses in this scripture is now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion. We get a glimpse sometimes in scripture, and I, and I love this about the Bible, is that because we're in the future, the way that they are written, we get a glimpse into the realities of what's taking place that the characters in the story don't get. Like we know that God is working I don't think Daniel knew it. Daniel didn't make this decision because he knew what God was gonna do. You may have read the book of Daniel before. You may know what the story is. You may know what happens next. Daniel didn't know what was happening next. The decision he made was about not conforming to the Babylonian culture and remaining faithful to God. That's why he made that decision. He didn't make the decision because he knew what was going to happen next. Like we get a glimpse, a peek into the the realities of what's happening in Daniel's life and how how God is is working behind the scenes to orchestrate and care for Daniel. And it's an amazing thing to look and see how God is working behind the scenes for Daniel. But man, how much I wish we could see God working behind the scenes in our own lives. Because God is working behind the scenes in your life right now. In the same way that he did for Daniel, he's working in your life at this very moment, no matter how far you feel you are from God. That he's working and operating in your life for your good, to draw you closer to him, to love you and to show you grace and to show you mercy, to show you favor. He's operating in your life in this very moment. I know know the things going on in your life make it hard to see because you feel like you're in the weeds because you've got all these things to worry yourself about and concern yourself about. But in the midst of those weeds is God. And God is working and he's orchestrating everything for Daniel. Now Daniel doesn't know this at the time. Daniel's simply operating to the best of his ability to, to remain faithful to God. And I, I'm sure there were times that Daniel felt far from God. 
I'm sure there's times that, that in this distant, far off land, this new place, this new culture, they felt like he was separated and distant from God. Maybe there are times he prayed and he's like, I don't, I don't feel God, you been there? Maybe you expected God to show up and, and he didn't. Maybe when they were dragging you out of Jerusalem, you thought, God, would you please rescue us? And he, he didn't. But we're beginning to see here in verse nine that God is at work and he's at work for Daniel. So, so the official is, is willing to play ball because God works with him. He's like, all right, I'm willing to, to play ball with you and, and figure out how to do this whole food thing. But I'm really nervous because if the king finds out, it's not good news for me. If, if he comes and you look weak and malnourished, I'm in trouble, man. So Daniel's like, okay, here's the deal. How about 10 days? Test it for 10 days. For 10 days, just give us, me and my three buddies, vegetables and water. And the three buddies are like, what are you talking about? He's like, no, listen, just vegetables and water. That's all I want for 10 days. And then come back after 10 days and see how we look. He's like, deal, we'll do that. So for 10 days, vegetables and water. That means tomorrow you would get up and for breakfast you have carrots and broccoli and a glass of water. For lunch, Brussels sprouts and asparagus and water. And for dinner, celery and I'm out of vegetables. Spinach and water, corn would be a good one. And then for a snack that night, you just cry because you're miserable, you just cry. That's what they did for 10 days, vegetables and water. That's it, vegetables and water for 10 days and look what happens. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. That statement we'll get to in later weeks. Could you, could you imagine for a moment being all these other guys? Like you, you just get to go to this full ride scholarship, you get all this food, you're getting, you're getting T-bone steak one night, cordon bleu the next, pork loins the next, man, it's such a good day, and then because this Daniel guy, now suddenly all you have is vegetables and water. Like my guess is Daniel didn't have a whole lot of friends in this moment but it benefited Daniel. So much so that, look at this, knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds, all given by who? By God. Like God's doing this awesome work in Daniel's life. Verse 18, at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. This is how the, the chapter ends. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And David remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Not only was Daniel and his friends deemed the best of the best to come to the college of King Nebuchadnezzar, but he also came out of this as the best of the best and entered into the king's service. Do you, you know how long he was there? 70 years. This story started when he was 15 years old. And for 70 years, he had the ear of the king. Kings come and kings go, Daniel's there. For 70 years, he had this, this position of prestige and honor and power and influence. For 70 years, he sat in a place of influence that was greater than magicians and enchant enchanters in the whole kingdom for 70 years, Daniel had this position all because he made a decision to not cross the line. He made a decision that there was a line that he would not cross. He made a decision that he would remain faithful to God and he would not conform. Are you going to resolve to not conform? Are you gonna to resolve to not conform to the ways of the world around you? I know you might not live under the rule of Babylon, but you live in a world that's counter to the kingdom of God. And the question is, are you going to allow yourself to conform to all of that or will you remain faithful to God and who you are? Because even though you, you may feel like you're in a different land and a different place, you don't have to be a different person. Just because the world around you has changed doesn't mean you have to change. 
You don't have to take on a new name and take on a new purpose and take on a new culture and take on a new life. You can remain faithful to who you are because you can make a decision that I'm not gonna conform there. I'm not gonna conform in that. I'm gonna remain faithful to who I am in God. We see this truth in the New Testament. Romans 12, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, his perfect will. Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is a picture of what Daniel did that he made a decision that I'm not gonna conform to the world around me. I'm gonna remain faithful to who I am in God. Like, I don't, I don't know what areas of your life you wrestle in and conforming to the world around you. I don't know what the line is that you're, you're just tempted to cross and, and, and maybe you need to just double down and resolve. I'm not gonna cross that line anymore. I'm gonna resolve to not conform to the world so I can remain faithful to God. Because here's the truth, friends. God is active right now in your life where you are. And I know it's easy to, to not feel that way because we have this circle of our faith, right? And, and our, our whole perspective of that is like, like we're driving ourselves to be more like God because we have this idea of God in the center and we're just trying to draw ourselves closer. And sometimes I feel distant, sometimes I don't, Maybe we viewed it wrong. That maybe it's not about you drawing closer to God. Maybe this is about you being here and this is God. That no matter where you are or what you're experiencing, God is present and God is active. And, and, and I know maybe you don't feel it and you don't experience it, but behind the scenes, God is working on your behalf because he loves you and he has grace for you and he has mercy for you. And no matter where you go or how distant you feel from God, God is near because how close we feel to God is not what determines his nearness. How do you feel about your closeness to God doesn't mean he's not there. Like the presence of God is not determined by how you feel about the presence of God. God is present. Like I, I, I find people all the time that we, we have conversations about like, I just don't, I don't feel God. I don't think God is close. No, 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 God is close. God is present. God is working. You just may not be aware of it. You may be like Daniel was in the very beginning and not fully aware of what God was doing behind the scenes, but God is active and God is working in your life right now. The question is, will you resolve to not conform? Will you resolve to remain faithful? Because just because you're in a different place doesn't mean you're a different person. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for just this picture that we have in Daniel of faithfulness. God, I know it, it, it's, it seems on the surface like a silly thing about the food and not eating the food, but, but God, so many times there are things in our life that, gosh, they may seem silly too, but, but they're just ways of us conforming to a world that you don't want us to conform to. Do you, you want us to draw a line and stand firm? So God, would you, would you help us to know that even when we feel far from you, that you're near? Would you help us know that even when we feel like we're in a distant foreign land, you are near and you're working? And remind us, Lord, that even when we don't feel close to you, it doesn't determine your nearness because you are always present and you're always working. Just help us to see it before it's too late. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.